for me, it was all about differentiation. And by developing a purpose-led strategy, what I realized was from a trustworthiness perspective, as long as it's done genuinely and intentionally, it survives investigation. This is Outside Sales Talk, the best podcast for outside salespeople. I'm your host, Steve Benson, and we're here to chat with the world's top sales experts so that you can get their best sales tactics to level up your game. Welcome back to Outside Sales Talk. Today, I have Roger Burnett with us, and we're going to talk about purpose-driven prospecting. Roger, thanks for coming on the show. Ah, thanks for having me. It's a lot of fun to be in the interviewee chair. That's right. Uh, by way of introduction, Roger is the founder of Social Good Promotions, which is a social enterprise built to teach and deliver purpose-based marketing strategies to businesses of all sizes, while also donating marketing services to nonprofit organizations. Uh, Roger is also the host of the So You're in Sales podcast. Um, so first question, let's jump into it here. Roger, how did you discover your passion for helping others provide value? Well, my sales career predates the internet. And in that process of field selling, when there was no real opportunity to do much in the way of due diligence about that particular prospect, you really had to come up with a strategy that would allow you to be the choice when there were a bunch of disparate choices that people could make, especially in that moment when there was really very little information that the buyer could get about the choices in the different companies that they might choose for whatever it was that you were selling. So for me, it was all about differentiation. And by developing a purpose-led strategy, what I realized was from a trustworthiness perspective, as long as it's done genuinely and intentionally, it survives investigation. And how do you think, you know, with what you're saying about purpose, how, how do you think companies can build their alignment around purpose? Well, you know, Steve, what, what I'd really tell you is while purpose is a valuable differentiation strategy, really what we're talking about here is alignment. And more so now more than ever, I find that buyers are interested in more than just what's going on with the specifics of the transaction itself. They're really equally as interested in the partner that they're choosing when they're making that choice. And so by giving yourself an opportunity to show what it is that your brand stands for, what you're really doing is you're allowing that buyer the opportunity to make a value judgment about your brand in a way that can be sticky. Because if they share your values, even if necessarily the elements of the transaction aren't perfect, they may be more willing to work with you about those specifics because they feel confident that the decision that they're making is something that they can defend. So what advice do you have for salespeople who are trying to identify their ideal customer? A lot of this has to do looking internally. So salespeople often are carrying the company line. And you know, those of us who really believe in what it is that we do, you know, I would have been in the early days of my sales career if one of our competitors happened to be in my presence and wanted to espouse something that suggested that they were superior to us in some way, shape or form, I would have been willing to fight over that because I believed in what I was doing to that degree. You know, I, I, I hearken back to that scene in the Anchorman movie where all the news teams are getting ready to rumble, you know, and it's <laughs> everybody wants their shot at what's going on. And, you know, in a lot of ways, it's very similar in sales for all of us because you're, you're needing to develop that to the degree that you believe in it with that degree of passion that you'd be willing to fight for it. So there's really two elements to this. The salesperson, he or herself, needs to understand for their own personal brand within the overall organizational brand, how 
they fit within their own alignment with what it is that their organization is doing. But more importantly, they need to be able to really reliably communicate what it is that their brand stands for so that they can give that prospect the opportunity to really be able to make that value judgment on their behalf. And if you've not done any work developing your talk tracks around what that means or what that sounds like, there's a real opportunity for practice there because you're going to need to be able to do that more so now more than ever. And if you've not spent any time developing that both personally and for the brand as a whole, then you're going to struggle against a competitor that's done that work and you have not. Absolutely. And, and how do you figure out what that right part of the market is where your ideal customer is? How, how, how can a salesperson prospect faster by focusing on that right part of the, the market? So due diligence is never really been quite as easy as it is today, thank you, internet. So the deep work that's necessary in research, I think is one of the things that salespeople and sales management need to recognize and build into the salesperson's week to afford them the opportunity to be able to reliably say to either the prospect in that moment when you get the chance to have that discussion, or even to justify the activity that you're doing to your sales manager, because I know typically speaking, if you're in the bullpen or working from home now, as it usually works out, if you're not doing the requisite amount of contacts, then you, one can't expect that the pipeline will fill. But if you've done that deep work in that research to really understand who your best prospects are, you should expect that your conversion rates will improve because you're gonna sound right to that person. You're gonna look right to them. You're gonna feel like someone that they may wanna do business with. And of course, you know, we, what we know now is that the first contact doesn't mean that we're on our way to a sale. What it means is we've established contact in a way that gives us the best possible opportunity to move that prospect along that buyer's journey that they're gonna come on to a point where eventually when they're ready to make an actual buying decision for what you sell, you've already done a lot of the legwork that's gonna be necessary to get you at the table and get that audience when the time is right. And how do they figure out what is the right part of the market? How do you, how, do, how does a salesperson segment the market? So what we're really saying, and what we talk about this a lot in our uh, cons consulting work is this notion of being a generalist versus being a specialist. And many times I'll run into salespeople and we'll get into an argument about who is your customer. And the answer oftentimes that I hear back is, well, everyone is my customer. And imagine the difficulty that you have when you've not developed anything along the lines of an area of specialty. So now really what you're trying to do is convince every single person that you're the right choice. And what we realize now is that most of the time that prospect is gonna make a value judgment on you based on what they can read about you, what they can see from you, what they are able to uh, glean from your website with respect to what it is that your company is all about. And if you're a generalist, you're spending a lot of time and energy and effort in that convincing side of the equation, that persuasive part of things. And to me, a specialist, right? If, if I have a problem and I go to a doctor and the doctor tells me, hey, you have a very specific problem and I need to refer you to someone whose specialty is what it is that your problem is. When I get to that doctor that is the specialist, I'm not spending a lot of time trying to hide what's wrong. I'm spending all of my time communicating to them what it is that my problem is so that we can get to the getting of getting to the problem solved as opposed to trying to have that doctor persuade me that they're the right person to solve my problem. So I would say, you know, in, in this uh, specific question, it's much more about developing that area of specialty so that you can create a really capable filter for yourself and be able to ask a relatively direct and targeted set of questions to that prospect to decide for yourself and for them whether or not this is going to be a good fit. Yeah, this saves you so much time on the on the qualification side, so much more efficient. It, what are some other ways salespeople can 
qualify and prioritize their prospects so that they don't waste time when they're in the field? You know, it's really, really like think of like realtors, right? So realtors, there's a million of them and they're each doing the exact same thing and basically selling the exact same product because any house that's on the market is available to be sold by any realtor. So if I can develop an area of specialty, so for instance, if I decided that I wanted to be the realtor who focused on fly fishermen, I'm going to have really, really, really narrowed down the audience of people who would probably be my particular prospect to the point that by the time they get to me, what they really want to know is not necessarily, can you sell me a house? It's, do you know where all the really good fly fishing spots are? Because if you do, then I want you to take me around to those places and show me the homes that might potentially be the places that I want to retire to when it's time to do that, because I don't have myself the time or opportunity to have done all of that research to know where those spots are. So by creating that area of specialty for yourself and being willing to, to ably communicate that in a way that people can find it, by the time they reach you, you know, you've really, you've established for them that you're going to be the right choice because like my uh, good buddy, Mark Schaefer says in his book, Marketing Rebellion, it's your customers who are actually doing the marketing for you these days. They're the ones that by virtue of what they've been able to learn about you, they're making a decision independent of any interaction between you and them about whether or not you're going to be the right choice. But if you don't give them that chance, now you fall right back into that persuasion pool where all of the rest of the generalists are going to be saying and doing the exact same things that you're trying to, to do. And it's just, it's going to be such a more difficult challenge than developing that area of specialty. And Typically, when I get into this part of the discussion, I'll watch my consulting customers start to squirm because in their minds, what they feel like they're doing is they're divorcing themselves from the remainder of the opportunity that may be out there. But what my point to them is, if people are looking for something from a generalist perspective, more often than not, the way that they're going to find their way to you is by virtue of referral. And so... Even if you are the realtor that is the fly fisherman and a non-fly fisherman wants to buy a house from you, they're not going to leave you and go buy from another realtor just because you're the specialist in the field of fly fishing. It's the strength of the referral that's going to hold that customer for you. And really by developing this sub-genre, if you will, it gives you the chance to supplement your sales efforts that are you know, referral driven or connection based that, you know, are, are kind of the regular blocking and tackling that typically makes up a lot of what we see today in traditional sales. Are there certain questions that salespeople should have in mind when they're qualifying customers that you'd like to share? I, I wrote a piece one time, it's called TikTok, I thought you were an expert, right? In consultative selling, and when we get trained on consultative selling, a lot of times it focuses on discovery. And what I think that we all recognize now, especially in the post-pandemic world, is people don't really want to spend the amount of time necessary to do incredibly deep dives around discovery. And so what I think your best bet is, is most customers' problems are not that unique. They, as customers, might be somewhat unique, but the problems that they have generally are not. So really, most of the time when I'm doing my upfront work with clients, what I'm trying to figure out is which of the other customers that I already do business with do you prospect look most like? Because if I can fast forward the rest of the discovery process and reliably communicate to you that I already recognize and understand the expertise that's going to be necessary to help solve your problem, then I'm going to leapfrog everybody else who's going to say to you, you know, Steve, I'm going to want to come in and spend maybe an hour, hour and a half really diving into the discovery part of this so that I can really get a good sense of who you are as a customer. If I'm saying to you, I have the depth of experience necessary to fast forward through that part of what my competition is going to take you through, then really I'm alleviating part of the pain that you as a prospect really don't wanna go through. And it takes it so that maybe 
I'm not fighting against a no decision, which a lot of times we as salespeople are not fighting against the competition, we're fighting against no decision. And by demonstrating that I recognize and can appreciate your problems and the slight nuance and uniqueness of your problems, but I also have developed solutions to problems like that for a multitude of other customers, I think I'm winning the game. And given your expertise in prospecting, what what do you do? How do you prepare for a meeting with a new prospect? Yeah, so you don't want to be so presumptuous as to come off as arrogant. That You have to maintain a level of humility and you have to be willing to give that prospect a safe space to communicate with you about what it is that they're really trying to get after. But most of the time, they're not even necessarily 100% sure. They know they have a problem. And they've probably done some research work to try to figure out what it is that you might be able to do for them to the point that they've even granted you this opportunity to have a discussion with them. But what you're really trying to get down to is I want to figure out which one of the other people that I work with you most closely resemble so that we can get to that stage of the game. And if you don't feel comfortable projecting that, then that's where the confidence on the other side of the table starts to erode. And that's when you start to see physical clues that suggest that you're not getting where you need to go with them. Or you walk out of a meeting and you feel like, wow, that went really well. And then nothing ever happens in the follow-up. It's because somebody else has done that work that you weren't able to do in a way that they were able to move that ball forward that you were not. And that's why it feels that way. Yeah, that makes sense. So it make make your prospect feel safe or create a safe space for them by showing them other customers who are similar to them. Correct. And the faster you can get to, hey, nope, yep, I totally got it. That makes perfect sense to me because this time and the time before and the time before that, I had similar situations. So let me explain to you how what we do solved that problem for those people does that seem like something you would be interesting in, interested in hearing more about? Sure. And, and it, let's say you, you your time is compressed and you only have three minutes with a prospect. What do you say? What messages do you try to communicate? Well, I'll, I'll take mine back to the purpose-based side of things, right? So our business is purpose forward. So really what I'm trying to get at in that three minute speech sounds something like this. Steve, I have the ability to grant you Bill Gates's money. I'm, I'm so excited to be able to make it so that you really don't have to worry about money for the rest of your life. As a matter of fact, I'd like you to give me some of that if you would. But there's one catch to this. In that process, you have to take the hours that you used to devote to your vocation and you have to devote it to something that you're passionate about. Can you tell me what that passion would be? Because If I can figure out what it is they're passionate about, I can build a solution that's built around the thing that they've identified to me as being something that they really care about. So if everything else is equal in the equation between me and my competition, I know I still have that one last thing that I can rely on that I'm hoping is gonna be the decision-making criteria that lets me win the game. So if you have something that, at the end is the final straw that usually wins the game for you, start with it. Why would you not start with that? Use those first three minutes to figure out like, hey, does what I'm going to tell you is my key differentiator matter to you? And if it does, then we should probably move this thing forward. If not, I'll move on to the next person that will preferably enjoy what it is that I'm gonna say. And that sounds like a really bold statement, but think about just how much faster that allows you to prospect. Because if there's nothing there that matches what your key differentiator is, why are you trying to convince them? Yeah, it's interesting how much weight an expert in, an expert in prospecting is putting on qualifying yeah. and, and, and how qualifying is such an important part of this process. Could, could you give an example of, of, of that last piece that you were saying of the you know, giving, like what, what is that? What's uh, an example company that, that is communicating, uh, that a sales rep could be communicating that key differentiator to their prospect? Let me frame it this way. So I'll frame it in a live transaction that happened to me. So 
I found out in the course of the due diligence that I was doing on the prospect that the owner was a veteran. So, on his website, we're a veteran owned business. Okay, so now I know that if there's a way for me to work this veteran angle, there's probably going to give me a better chance of winning than if I don't have a way to use that to my advantage. So I sell promotional marketing items. And in this instance, that particular company was interested in buying pieces of drinkware, namely a tumbler, right? So we all have one. Most of the time it's Yeti. And it's kind of a status symbol. I have my Yeti, check me out, right? So people assign a certain amount of value to the brands that they associate themselves with. And when I was speaking to that particular customer in the setting of the appointment, they had said to me, we're really interested in putting together this Yeti program. So I can do that. But what I know is there's like seven other people in town who can sell Yetis. So now what's happened is it's going to be what are you going to sell the Yeti for versus what they're going to sell the Yeti for? And I just don't really want to play that game because that's a price battle and it's a race to the bottom. And it's everything that all of us as salespeople hear all the time. But I have a tumbler line that actually when our customers buy those tumblers, the factory that I buy them from gives away 20% of the sale of the proceeds of that tumbler to a nonprofit called Homes for Our Troops. And what Homes for Our Troops does is they give disability. So if you're wounded in combat, when you come home, Homes for Our Troops will modify your home to make it ADA compliant. And if they cannot modify your home sufficiently well to get the compliance, Steve, they'll tear the house down and build you a new home. It's an amazing program. So I brought back not a Yeti tumbler, but this Patriot tumbler. And I explained to the buyer what the correlation was and why I thought it was important for them to consider Patriot over Yeti. Here's the piece I didn't know. The owner's son also had been in the army and died in combat in Afghanistan. When I showed her what this tumbler was all about, it looks just like a Yeti. There's really not much difference to it other than it doesn't say Yeti on the outside, it says Patriot. And I explained to them about the give back part of what goes on. She literally stopped me in my tracks. She got up out of her chair. She went and got the owner and brought him in the room. We had this discussion about the Patriot Tumblr and he's like, well, so wait a minute. So what you're saying is instead of me just giving the Yeti out and trying to build some brand goodwill for my company because I put my logo above the Yeti logo, now I can tell the story about hey, we're a veteran-owned company. We really believe passionately in veterans' causes. So if you too care about veterans' causes, maybe you'd want to do business with us. So please take this tumbler. Hopefully that you know sets us apart from our competition and whatever it is that they're selling. And maybe that is the difference between them remembering your brand or not. So here's the, the epilogue of the story because I was certain I was getting that order. I get a phone call from the buyer about a day later asking for a discount. She said, hey, I was online and I found a similar tumbler and they are 25 cents less per piece. Can you match that price? My answer was an emphatic no, absolutely not. Because what do you think the difference in cost is? It's probably the donation to Homes for Our Troops, right? And I told her, I said, look, I can sell you another tumbler. As a matter of fact, if you'd like, we can go back to the Yeti, but you don't get the discount and the story. I'm sorry, that's not how it works. You don't get to tie the brand narrative that I just gave you that would allow you to use that tumbler to give you a leg up against your competition because you want a discount. And there was that pregnant pause and you know, Steve, the first person who talks after that wins. And her answer was, fine, let's process the PO. What am I gonna tell the owner if I don't buy these anyway? And really all she was doing was her job. Yeah. She didn't really even need the discount. She was just doing what she had been trained to do. And I, because of my conviction, because I believe so passionately in what I was selling, I was able to defend my price and hold the line and get the order and win the deal. But if I hadn't spent the time to understand the brand values that they had, then I never had that chance to make all of that work for me in the way that ultimately was going to allow me to win that deal. Yeah, well, I think 
I think that building that trust uh, that you get with understanding is so important. I mean, if you really understand someone's company, someone's brand, what they stand for, you can communicate better with them. They'll trust you more. Um, and trust is really important when you're when you're prospecting. What, what, what do you have any other ideas how a salesperson can become a trusted resource when they're prospecting? Yeah, you know, trust is paramount now. You know, and inherently we would all say, well, trust has always been important. But the difference now is the traditional methods that we would have employed to build trust have been eliminated. We most of the time can't even be in the physical presence of the prospect in order to look for things like nonverbal clues that would give us a chance to feel like maybe we're earning the trust that we're looking for that would be the thing that's going to get us to the finish line when we need it. So to me now, by focusing on the fact that trust has grown in importance in this new socioeconomic post-pandemic climate that we're dealing with, I actually believe that the salesperson's responsibility first and foremost is to recognize and appreciate where they are on the continuum of trust with the person they're talking with in that very moment. And what we should be doing as salespeople is building activities based on where we are in that level of trust with that person and then looking for clues about are we getting there because I can't see it. I've got to figure it out in different ways. And only then should I change what I'm doing in where we are in this transaction. And if we stay at a weak trust relationship, you just keep hanging out, doing the activities that you've created for yourself with that person until they give you some kind of idea that you've moved yourself up in that uh, trust continuum. And when you focus on the weak relational moments that you have, we would tell you that content is very important. And if you can build that content in such a way that it does one of four things, you're giving yourself a real opportunity at success. The content should do one of four things. It should educate, it should inform, it should entertain, or it should inspire. And Steve, if you can get it to do multiple things at once, what I've witnessed is an acceleration of your move up that trust continuum with that person at that moment. But what we as salespeople do too often is we try to push it. And right now, this is the worst time in the world to be trying to push it because if you don't have that trust-based relationship and you try to push it, what used to be seen as maybe an annoyance or an intrusion now could be a black eye. It could be a black mark. It could be a don't ever call me again because you pushed it in a moment where I'm not emotionally capable of handling you pushing me in a way because there's probably stuff going on in their lives that you don't know anything about. And what I've witnessed now is in a complex sale and an enterprise level sale, the intervals between decision-making when you're moving someone along that buyer's journey have stretched. And it's because there's all kinds of things going on on that side of the transaction that you know nothing about. And if for the sake of your own pipeline, you're trying to move that customer in a way that's unnatural for them, it's at your own peril. It really is. So the next section is sales in 60 seconds, where we are going to ask quick questions and quick answers. So first question, what's a common mistake that you see reps make in their conversations with prospects? Uh, don't go from LinkedIn connection to pitch, please, for the love of God. It's the worst thing ever. I only so, get about 60 of those a day. Oh my God. It's, <laughs> and, and you know, I can't tell you how many replies that I've written and then deleted because it's really not even worth the effort. You know, I, I just say the same thing every time copy paste. Like as when I, when I go through my LinkedIn messages, I just have the same three things basically that I keep saying over and over again <laughs> for 95% of the, the reach outs. Yeah. For, and, and sales managers out there, if you're teaching this to people, please, for the love of God, stop. It's awful. You are, you are taking what could be a great platform to build relationships and you're making it something that people are getting to the point where they want to avoid. So please just cut it out, come up with something different, 
find someone to help you figure out how to build something elegant within that whole platform that will actually bring you business. Because if you do it right, it will work. But connection to pitch is dead wrong, period. What would you say is the number one key to differentiate yourself from competitors? Show your work. If I come into your office or we do a Zoom call and you like what you hear, and then you go out to do some more research about me or my organization and what you see is not congruent with what I said, it creates dissonance on the part of the buyer and that will do nothing but take whatever goodwill you've built and toss it right out the window. So you've got to be able to create an opportunity for what you put out there to be a reflection of what it is you're gonna to say to people when they ultimately find their way to you. And you have to do it. Are there any tools that you recommend salespeople use during the prospecting process? Video, 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 video. I can't say it enough. And the tools have gotten cheap. They're easy. They are easily accessible. You don't need your company to do this for you, you can do it for yourself. The average iPhone is better than most people's cameras these days. And if you have something of interest that you think people would wanna know about, why not capture it? If you're coming out of a call and something noteworthy happened, you should be documenting that because whatever happened in that moment is gonna happen again for somebody else. And if they can find that and know that that's something that you're capable of doing for them, you're giving yourself a much better opportunity to get that uh, email to happen or the phone to ring in the way that you're going to want it to. What's the best sales advice that you've ever received? This notion of alignment and attunement. It really is. You, you have to believe in what it is you're doing. You have to make it your own. You have to speak in your own voice. If they give you a script, learn the script and then learn how to make it sound like you said it, not what somebody taught you to say. Because if it comes off forced or stiff or something that's not a true reflection of your personality, you're not gonna be able to sustain that for the long term. So eventually that veneer is gonna crack. And if you've attracted that person because of the veneer and then suddenly it goes away, like we were talking about dissonance, imagine how that's gonna feel for that person. And if, I, and I know this has happened, it's happened, to many of us, suddenly someone ghosts you. And it's infuriating. It's like, I put all this time and energy and effort into trying to move this thing to its completion. And now I can't even get them to respond to me. And most likely if you were to diagnose what happened, it's that crack in the veneer that you got to that point where you felt comfortable in being your true self and they didn't enjoy it because they were enjoying what you had shown them in the veneer leading up until that point. And now you show your true self and they're like, oh man, I don't like that. That's not what I was hoping for. And they don't feel any responsibility to tell you. They feel like you were a fraud and they don't owe you any more time. And we're sitting on the other side of the transaction feeling like, my God, what happened here? I forecasted that thing for the love of God. And now I can't even get the person to return my phone call. So. Yeah, you, you've got to, you've got to make it your own. You've got to practice. You've got to put the repetition in and you've got to feel comfortable enough to make it your own for sure. And what do you think that all salespeople should do every single day to become more successful? You can't improve what you don't measure. And most of the time, the indicators that we all are looking at are lagging, right? So Pipeline is a lagging indicator. Sales results are a lagging indicator. Where are you in the elements of the sales journey in each step of the process from prospect to close? And where are you falling down? Where is it that you suddenly lose the traction that you're able to build? If it's top of funnel, focus on your top of funnel. What is it that you need to do to be able to reliably fill your pipeline in a way that's going to sustain you for the down funnel activity that you're going to need to perform? Or if it's when you get to quote phase and suddenly you're not having the conversion success that you're looking for, it's because you haven't built enough value in that person's eyes at that stage of the game. Or maybe you went to quote too soon. So if you're not measuring the leading indicators 
and really delving into where those weaknesses are occurring and trying to strengthen that piece of what you do, then you can just continue to ex expect more of the same results. And as an actionable takeaway, what should the field salespeople listening today do as the very first step towards getting started on purpose-driven prospecting? So this is going to sound funny, but it's, what do you like to do? Do you like to write? Then write. Do you like to be on camera? Then be on camera. Do you like to speak into a microphone? Then speak into a microphone. Whatever it is that you're comfortable doing, do that. Don't do something because you feel like that's what you need to do in order to somehow check a box. Because that's what I see a lot of the time. It's like, oh, well, my competitor put out a podcast, so I should put out a podcast. But I don't like to interview people. I don't like to have this kind of dialogue with folks. I don't like to really peel back the onion on things. So do you think that you're going to really be dedicated to continuing to do that activity over time? Chances are what's going to happen is you're going to do it for a while. You're not going to have much success and you're going to stop doing it. Uh, a statistic that I uh, heard recently said the average podcast lasts five episodes. Hmm. And what that suggests to me is that the people who are doing that podcast didn't really have their heart in it because I've been doing mine for four years and I do it because I genuinely enjoy doing it. I genuinely wanted to be a writer growing up. And what I found was I could marry my love of writing with my curiosity and turn that into really good questions, which also makes for a very good salesperson. So in the process of developing really strong questions, what I'm really doing is developing a very fast relationship with my prospect because I'm asking them the kind of questions that they would really want to be asked. So if you're not enjoying what it is that you think you might do, just don't do it. Wait until you can come up with the thing that you're really going to enjoy doing. And if that's TikTok, then do it on TikTok because you will continue to do that as opposed to trying to make YouTube videos when you don't even know how to do video editing. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to try to summarize the, the things that you've said for the folks that are in the car here. Um, so today, buyers are interested in who they're partnering with. And so as a salesperson, you should show buyers what your brand really stands for. Do research to understand who your best prospects are and identify the best customers that you have uh, currently in your, in your book of business right now, and then find prospects with similar backgrounds. Once you do this research, your conversion rate will increase. Develop a few questions that are specific and help you qualify prospects quickly so that you don't waste time in the field. You want to create a safe space for prospects by showing them that you work with people like them. Trust is so important in today's sales environment. So start by telling your brand's story to build trust with your prospects. Salespeople need to continue to create activities with their prospects that help to build trust. This has been just fantastic, Roger. Where, where can our listeners read more about your work? How do they get to know you better? Where, where can they reach out to you? Uh, I'm, I'm almost reluctant to say reach out to me on LinkedIn. Just don't go to pitch. <laughs> but if you don't go to pitch, I love that this is my favorite place to connect with other sales professionals. And if you want to learn more about a purpose-based selling approach, I actually released a book last September called Red Goldfish Promo Edition, How Promotional Products Leverage Purpose to Increase Impact. And it's really a field guide for salespeople to develop the things that they're passionate about within the categories that we've identified around a purpose-based sales approach so that if you don't want to necessarily dream up something for yourself, the book is just chock full of case studies of other companies in the promotional marketing industry and the ways that they've used a purpose-led approach to help themselves stand out in a crowded and noisy and difficult marketplace. And I know there'll be some people out there who are like, well, I don't sell promotional marketing. But remember what I said, this is about alignment and attunement. And if purpose is your thing, regardless of what you're selling, typically the pillars that most purpose-led businesses are using are not dissimilar. 
So you can still apply the principles that you would read in that book to your own business if purpose is what you're really after. So Red Goldfish Promo Edition is available on Amazon in both paperback format and on Kindle. And if you have a Kindle Unlimited account, it's actually free. Awesome. Well, this has been a great episode of the Outside Sales Talk. If you work in field sales, you'll love Badger Maps. The number one route planner helps you sell 20% more while driving 20% less. You can get a free trial at badgermapping.com today. If anyone can think of any other sales reps that would benefit from the, the skills that Roger has taught us today about prospecting, share the love and forward this episode on to them. Thanks for coming, Roger, and, and take care until next time, everybody.